Welcome, everybody. Thanks uh, for joining us here for this session on the boundaries of SAST. I'm going to quickly introduce myself and then introduce the topic. One announcement up front, there are going to be some code samples that, I, that are going to be fine print, and they're, uh, they're not actually very well readable from the back of the room. I will talk you through them, but if you want to uh, understand them in detail, you might want to come a little bit further to the front. Entirely up to you. Um, yeah, so I'm, my name is Frans van Buhl. I work for Fortify. Uh, as the product manager for the static analysis part of Fortify. Uh, so we have our booth here. Fortify is nowadays part of Open Text. It used to be uh, Microfocus before that and HP before that, so it has been acquired many times, but Fortify is the name that most people still recognize. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Fortify in this session. It's going to be product agnostic, just talking about general trends and algorithms as it comes to SAST. Um, my experience doing presentations like this is that at the end, you sh people usually come to you, and that's normally great. Uh, to have a talk, but this time I actually have to leave to the airport very quickly after this, so I won't have time for that. If you want to stay in touch after that, more than welcome, and we can set up a Zoom meeting or whatever. Um, so looking at the topics, I'm going to talk about SAST, and I'm going to talk about everything as code and how these two things relate. So just to gauge the interest in SAS a little bit, are, are, are many of you using SAS? Like who's using SAS in their daily life? Uh, that's the vast majority of you, so you know this, right? So, so SAST is the um, uh, static application security testing. It's the process of taking source code without executing it, running it through an algorithm to find security vulnerabilities, and there are many vendors that do that. So here I took a list from uh, the Gartner uh, Magic Quadrant of 2023. There are actually many more. And you would have seen many of these names here on the conference floor, right, because they all have boots. So why people are doing that? Well, ultimately, scalability. Right, so you can do a manual code review that's actually better. Right? I love our tool, but a good human code review has better results than what we can do with the tool. Uh, but humans don't scale very well. And if you have very large application portfolios and you have very fast release cycles and security matters, then you need to automate the code review, and that's what we do. If you look at everything as code, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more extensively. Um, so once upon a day, right, so we had code, and code was created for applications. And that's why OWASP is still, you know, and its acronym is about applications, web applications. But nowadays, code is used for many other things. So here I've tried to create a list of things that came to mind. I'm, I'm sure if you think about it for another hour, you would find many more examples. You know, we have infrastructure as code. It's very popular. Many of our customers are already using that. I'm going to talk about contracts as code when more... Um, more often referred to as smart contracts, uh, CI/CD pipelines, but also hardware, uh, policy as code. I think there was even a, a session on policy as code today. Um, do monitoring as code. There are many, 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 many things. So what does that mean, and what is that exactly? If you would try to define that, like what, what is this space and what characterizes it, the first thing that, that would probably come to mind is that we're talking about files that are both human-readable, so you can create them, but they're also machine readable, right? They're automatically executed or interpreted in some way. But that's not enough, right? That's, that's a very thin definition, and that would make like everything on a Linux system under the etc directory like infrastructure as code of a letter or something. That's not what we mean. There are a couple of more things there. Um, usually infrastructure as code is also associated with using like typical code practices, like having code repositories and version management. Uh, it's also about having some advanced structures that allow you to reuse code, right? I've become more effective in writing code. And it's exactly those types of things that also introduce the possibilities of exploits. Right? That's why it becomes interesting and security problems can exist. Uh, let's look at a motivating example. So this is a, an example that I've taken from the GitHub site. It's, a, it's um, a problem that can, a security problem that can occur in CI CD as code. So in this case, uh, GitHub workflows. And it's an injection style attack. So what we see here is that uh, we have a piece of code here, which is probably small, um, but it is YAML. So a GitHub workflow is, uh, on its outline, is a YAML file. But in that YAML file, we can have run clauses, and there we can have a bash script. So what's going to happen is that the content of that run field will be executed as a bash script by GitHub. Um, but there is something special that makes it interesting. You can use the syntax here in your bash script that consists of a dollar sign with two curly braces. And whatever is in there will first be interpreted by GitHub 
Uh, so there are a number of implied variables that you can set um, or that just are being taken from whatever is, uh, you know, is happening in, it, in the context. And that gets replaced there. So in this case, it's taken the pull request title. So the pull request title gets set here to the title environment variable. Now that's really dangerous because if, if in, you use a double quote in your pull request title, which you can do in an open source project, then you would kind of escape that string constant space and you can then execute arbitrary bash commands in that bash context. Right? So you can do bash injection through, uh, through the GitHub workflow in this case. Um, and that's just one motivating example of why this is an interesting space, right? Everything as code can be very insecure. Um, so what are we gonna look at? So question you could ask is, does it make sense to use SaaS technology for everything as code? I think the first example already is a hint that that might be really interesting. Um, but if so, can SaaS tools already do that right now or are there new capabilities that are needed to make that work? And I think there are. So we're gonna examine that by first looking a little bit more in depth at SaaS, like how does that work on the dude? Uh, and then we're gonna look at two motivating examples. So the first one is gonna be BICEP, so an infrastructure as code language by Microsoft. And the second one is gonna be Solidity. So that's a smart contract language for the Ethereum blockchain. And we're gonna see what kind of things can occur there and how we should detect those things using static analysis technology. So if you look at SaaS, there are many different tools, right? As we've seen, many different vendors. Uh, if you look at what they have in common, they would all work more or less like this. So you take source code, you read that, uh, and then you put that in some in intermediate representation, right? Some form in memory that allows you to start calculating on it. And then you do an analysis and you get results. And there are all kinds of variations, but that's the general scheme. Um, the particular variation that I wanna talk a lot about a little bit more in depth, because it's, because it's relevant to the rest, is the algorithms. Um, so some of the algorithms are honestly boring. Uh, so start, let's start with those, and then we're gonna, to, gonna get to the more exciting ones. So the boring one is called structural analysis. And what you can do with it is catch things like a hard-coded password, for instance. So here in the, in the top example, you have a hard-coded password, quite obviously. And due to stru with structural analysis, we can find that by recognizing that we have a variable called password, and it gets assigned some string literal. Right? And that's the telltale sign of a hard-coded password. It's kind of useful, uh, but it's also very unreliable. So here we would see two examples where it doesn't work, right? So the first one is a typical false positive. So we have something that's called password. It does get assigned a hard-coded value, but that is something else than the actual password, typically some prompt that the user would see to enter a password. The other example uses the word wachtwoord, which is the translation of password in my native language. Uh, and that would not be recognized by most SAS tools, right? So you would have a false positive and a false negative. So this is useful and you kind of have to do it to be a complete SAS tool, but it's fundamentally not that interesting. The more important thing is called taint analysis. So taint analysis is the idea that we can track a user input, which may also be contained like an attack vector, track that through the program and see where it can do harm. So this example takes is a piece of Java code using Spring. So in, here, in this case, we would see based on the spring annotations that we have a method that takes user input. We see some assignments, function invocations, and then we see that go into a spring JDBC template. And because we can track that flow, that taint, we can know that there's a vulnerability. So that's how we analyze that. If you think this through a little bit more, you would find that there are some complications or some nuances. And two of those cases are here. So the, the first case, is uh, a confidentiality problem. So here we're gonna read a password. So we're gonna use a particular API in Java that's there to read a password. So if something comes out of there, we can be sure that that reasonably is a password. And we're gonna print that to standard out. That is, a co that is a confidentiality problem, right? So now we've leaked the password. So that is a kind of taint, just like the SQL example case, but we need to keep these things apart Right, if we would have the taint in the first sense, in the sense of the first example, the web input, and we would print that to the, st to the standard out, there's no real problem. Um, uh, it's, we need to somehow maintain the notion of having taint flags. Right? In the first example, we had like web taint or user input taint. 
And in this example, we have like confidentiality taint or password taint or whatever you want to call it. But we need to be specific about what kind of taint we're talking about exactly. Second example is something where you cannot really use taint analysis to analyze it. So what we're going to do there is we're going to read a password and we're going to encrypt it to keep it safe. Uh, question is, which encryption algorithm? And this particular piece of code uses DES. So we have an algorithm here being set in a string constant. And then when we create the cipher algorithm to do the encryption, we refer to that constant. Uh, now, DES obviously is a very outdated, completely insecure algorithm. So that's something that you want a static analysis tool to flag, right? You should use AES or something. Uh, to do that, you kind of need to track that value of that variable algorithm. So that's called constant propagation. It's like taint, but you cannot really think of that as taint alone. It's a, it's a different algorithm. Interesting thing there is that the, um, in this area, there's a big difference between how commercial vendors like us speak usually about these algorithms versus what the academic literature says. So if you look at the, um, the marketing material of our product and, and that of the competitors, it kind of equates taint analysis with data flow analysis. It's the same thing. Um, if you look at the scientific literature, data flow analysis would be the more encompassing term. And taint analysis is a more specific type of data flow analysis, like constant propagation as well, and uh, other types exist as well. And that's, that's the way I will be talking about it from here on. But that, co that confusion may occur so now and then. Um, let's look, look a little bit further under the hood. Like uh, in that initial diagram, that arrow analysis was just there as if that was a really simple thing to do. And of course, there's lots of logic going on there. So now we're zooming in a little bit into that analysis phase. Um, there are all kinds of complexities there, um, but what happens on a very high level is that we first generate a control flow graph, like a flow chart, if you will, of the program. And then uh, we do the calculations. And the calculations, they uh, essentially consist of setting up what, what's called data flow equations. So data flow equations are like um, uh, expressions that determine like if you have this taint or these data flow values going into a particular block, given the nature of that block, what will come out of that? And then if you know that of every single block of the program, you can then start looking for like a stable solution that has the correct data flow values assigned everywhere. Um, and that is difficult to do for performance reasons. If you do that very naively, uh, then you would get an exponential complexity problem that never, never, never terminates for a realistic problem. So you're gonna make approximations, all kinds of details there. But roughly that's the idea. You set up the equations, you solve them. And then after that, you know, the data flow value, so particularly the taint flags associated everywhere. And that's how that works. Now understanding this is important for our topic uh, because in, in setting things up like this, we have already introduced some bias into our system that um, doesn't help in these new use cases for everything as code. In particular, the idea that you can create that control flow graph and that that's a useful way of thinking about your problem that bias, that is, that's biased towards imperative languages, right? Languages that say, well, do this, do this, do this, do this. Uh, in reality, many of these infrastructure as code languages are declarative in nature, right? They just say, they state facts or things that should be the case. Um, but the order of those things doesn't matter no? because the order of facts doesn't change the facts. So for, for declarative languages, this is a bit of a problematic approach. Um, the other thing, where this tends to be biased is, you know, what does that intermediate representation look like? Um, if, you, um, if you think about uh, the requirements that you would have for that, you, know, you want it to be universal, you want it to be applicable to any language you want to analyze, but it should also be simple because otherwise your analysis algorithm becomes really complex. And that's a hard thing to balance. If you look at our product, our, our intermediate representation was designed 20 years ago because it's, an outdated, or it's, an, it's, a, it's a product that has been around for a long time. And that's kind of holding us back right now because the, uh, the diversity of source code coming in doesn't really fit well in what we currently use as an intermediate representation. Um, now with this background, let's start looking at our, our, uh, our, our, our cases, the first one being bicep. So if you look at, yes, who was familiar with bicep? Anybody? So BICEP is an, is an infrastructure as code language designed by Microsoft, and it's specific to the Azure platform. 
to use it to create virtual machines and storage accounts and websites, et cetera, in Azure. Um, that system that Microsoft offers to automatically create resources in Azure is called Azure Resource Manager, which is a really cool and descriptive title, also called ARM. Now, originally, ARM could be programmed in a JSON format, and you can still do that. That's called ARM JSON templates. But as we'll see shortly, these are quite, kind of unwieldy. So Microsoft designed Bicep as a, as a much more attractive alternative to that. So right now, you can compile Bicep code to ARM JSON code. As an author, you can choose whether you want to write one or the other. So this is not going to away, but you, Bicep's just easier. Then we deploy that code to Azure. And this code can call that code. And that's an important thing for SaaS requirements. Um, this is an example. Um, so here to the left, we have the bicep uh, syntax, which is a decorative syntax. And in this case, it creates a storage account in Azure. Uh, so some place where you can just store some data. Uh, and to the right, we have the JSON equivalent of that, which is actually twice as long, just didn't fit there even with a small font. And that's immediately like the, the motivating thing behind bicep, right? Because the thing to the right is really, really cumbersome to write. So if you think about this, like what's, what's the kind of thing that you would expect a SaaS tool to do? Like what are the risks that we could cover? There are essentially two groups of things. So one thing is that um, the infrastructure that we're describing may effectively be insecure. Right? So that's not so much that the program is, the bicep program is insecure. It's just that it creates something that is insecure. But that would be the primary thing that, that would be useful to see with an automatic analysis. Um, here we have an example. Um, we're creating a MySQL server in Azure, uh, but we're not saying that it should use SSL. Uh, so it may also be accessed uh, with non-SSL connections, which is something you would want to flag. Now, the reason why we would know that here, that that's possible, is um, kind of indirect. So that, and, and it's a, a picked the example to, to show you some of the complexities. But in the simplest case, we would just have SSL enforcement disabled, right? And then we could immediately detect that. Here we have something more subtle. So here we say that this template actually has a parameter called SSL enforcement choice. So that's something that the user will provide to Bicep when deploying. Um, here we're saying which values are allowed, and that includes both disabled and enabled. So if you take the combination of that decorator and the fact that this parameter is used there, then you can logically conclude that it may be disabled, and that's the thing that you should flag. So that's the kind of reasoning that you need to have to, to accurately report these issues. But there's also a second group of issues. So that has nothing to do with the infrastructure being created, but with the bicep script as such, or script is a wrong word, the bicep template as such being insecure. Um, the example here is that we're reading, a we're reading a parameter again, and that parameter has been annotated as being secure. So that practically means that it's like entering a password, so you get you don't get the echoing to the console, you get the uh, stars or anything. Um, so by seeing that decorator, we know that that's a secure parameter. And here we um, use that in a string interpolation format. So the variable credentials will be the username, a colon, and the password. And then we print that using the output directive. If you would have tried to print it direct directly, so print the password directly using output, uh, the bicep uh, compiler would warn you against that. But in this case, it will not because there is this intermediate step and it doesn't follow that. So here you kind of need to do uh, that taint analysis for confidential taint, but then through a bicep template. So what do you need to do as a SaaS tool to, to, to capture this ecosystem correctly and do, and do powerful analysis? Well, one important thing is that we need to understand both bicep and arm JSON. Right? So it's, you cannot really think of them in isolation because they can call each other. So you need to understand how they together form one ecosystem and understand that interoperability as well, which is not trivial. It doesn't come automatic in a SAS algorithm. The second thing um, is that you need to kind of understand that you have, have arm JSON as an encapsulated language living in a JSON context. Um, if you look at what SAS tools do, do in terms of like mixed languages, you have simpler cases than that. So you have 
uh, things like uh, JavaScript existing in HTML, for instance, right? What we would do in those cases is just extract the JavaScript from the HTML and then treat it as JavaScript. That's really easy. Uh, this is a fundamentally different case. This is more like in the same way as you have the OZ model for networking where the TCP packet kind of lives inside an IP packet. It's encapsulated there. Uh, you have something here as well. So you have that ARM JSON language, which somehow is encapsulated in JSON, but had definitely has its own syntax, right? So here we have um, that grads variable here. And we have a format function being invoked and the signal to ARM that this is not just a string literal, is the square bracket, right? Because it's between square brackets, it will be interpreted. And we have things here going on like um, a parameters a field here in, in the JSON where we have a parameter name password and that has a type secure string, right? So to interpret that correctly, you need to really need to think about that as a parameter being declared. Now, we cannot treat all JSON like this, right? Because alternative to bicep JSON or ARM JSON, you might also have Ansible JSON or uh, Terraform JSON. They would have different rules. It would be JSON, but with a different language embedded in that. So the way we're currently thinking about that is that we need to have a capability to start parsing something as JSON, but then do like a, a, a second level or second degree parse to understand that encapsulated language as well and then have the ability to do that for multiple languages differently as appropriate. Um, third thing specific to, to this case is handling the declarative nature. So we saw that example, right, of, of printing the password. Um, what is certainly an echo if I go stand there. Uh, we could have rewritten that example like this. So we could have the output statement first, then declare the credentials variable, and then have the two parameters. But if you think about that as a uh, standard imperative program, like a Java program, that doesn't make any sense, right? Because if you, once you hit that first line, that creds variable hasn't been initialized yet. But in Bicep, that doesn't matter at all because it's a decorative environment. So you, you cannot think about that using that same control flow graph and the same algorithms. You need to compensate for that. Uh, and then finally that, you know, because the, the majority of the things we want to detect are about that insecure infrastructure, that constant propagation algorithm becomes really, really important. In normal cases, that's a bit of a rounding error or some cases where it's important, like key length. But generally speaking, it's not that interesting. Here, it's absolutely key. So that's BICEP. Let's look at our second case. So that's Solidity. Anybody familiar with Solidity? Yay. So Solidity is for um, writing smart contracts. So Solidity lives in the Ethereum blockchain. Um, rough, the rough ecosystem is that you have Solidity code, you compile that to something that's called EVM bytecode. So EVM is the Ethereum virtual machine, uh, something like the Java virtual machine or the .NET virtual machine. And that virtual machine executes on the uh, Ethereum blockchain. So that means that every node that has a copy of the blockchain will execute all of these contracts on the, on the locally running uh, EVM. Um, you can do this on some other blockchains and using some other languages, but that's complexity we can't forget for, about for now. What you can do with that is all kinds of different things, but generally they call the space Web3 or Web3.0. So that's the idea of having a distributed capability to have things like ownership and transactions. Uh, specifically, you can do things like auctions or uh, gambling or uh, buying NFTs uh, or having insurance contracts and all in a way that doesn't require a, th a trusted third party. You can all do that in the, on the blockchain. So that's an interesting capability. Um, let's have a look at some, some examples. This is the classic hello world example uh, as a smart contract. Um, so we see a Java-like language, so with curly braces and uh, semicolons. Uh, instead of classes, we have contracts. So in Solidity, uh, as contracts as the base notion, contracts can be deployed on the blockchain, which is very much like instantiating a class in an object-oriented language. And then it can have fields, so data, uh, and it can have methods, so methods correspond more to transactions. Right? So that's how 
we kind of map that object-oriented thinking to contract thinking. Um, let's skip this. Here we have uh, an example that goes a little bit beyond the uh, hello world. So here we have a contract with uh, a counter. This again, this doesn't do anything useful, right? It's just to illustrate some of the way the language works. <coughs> um, so we have a function to obtain the current value of a counter, which is just returning the, the, the field. But we also have an increment and decrement function that are actually transactions that change the value of that counter. Right? Completely uninteresting, but just to give you a bit of a flavor of how this language works. If you think about what, what's, what's interesting here from a security point of view, uh, quite a few things. Uh, so there are some references here. Um, this is one that says that uh, these projects have lost more than $2 billion over the last year, <laughs> it, all, all due to security problems, right? So something is at stake here. Um, the overview to the right is actually from a site called Rekt, rekt.news, and they keep track of all the various hacks that occur in this space. Uh, these eight ones, that's the score for October of this month. Right? That's just over the past couple of weeks. There's lots of hacking going in. There are many security problems with these smart contracts and the damages are enormous if it happens. So there's also a very uh, lively industry, of course, of auditors that review these smart contracts and charge very high fees because it's, you, know, you, you really want to prevent any problems there. Uh, to, um, to make it even worse, one thing you cannot do with a smart contract is withdraw it. Once it's deployed, it's part of the blockchain, it will be there forever. There's no way that you can say, well, hey, I made a mistake, I didn't mean it like that. Uh, it's just there. So if you want to have some facility to terminate the contract, you need to have that built in as part of your contract logic. And then, of course, you might have a transaction that says, I'm terminating it and I'm no longer processing more things. But you cannot fundamentally end a contract once it's deployed. Um, now, to um, make sure that you don't have these security problems, standards have emerged. There's this site called the SWC Registry, the Smart Contract Weakness Classification. They have pioneered this field. They have about 40 categories of problems specific to smart contracts. It's kind of like the CWE for regular programming. Um, nowadays, they're no longer maintaining that. Uh, and it's now part of the um, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. So they have a new standard that has kind of adopted those things but added more to it. So if you want to know more about this space and the actual security aspects, then this is a really great, great resource. I'm going to take two, uh, I want to explain two specific vulnerabilities to you. So there are like 40 something that we could discuss, but two of them are really interesting because they are uh, the source of some really major hacks. So they have a huge impact, uh, but they're also not trivial to find. But they're also things that are really easy to find, but these ones definitely are not easy to find for a SaaS tool. <coughs> So the first one is called uh, the TX origin attack. So the TX origin attack has to do with authorization. Right? If in, in many smart contracts, you need to have some kind of authorization. The more, most classical case would be that only the owner of a smart contract is allowed to withdraw funds, right? which is a very reasonable requirement to have. So then if a, if a transaction comes in, you need to check whether the initiator of that transaction is the same person as the owner of that transaction. If that's the case, then the withdrawal may proceed. If not, then not. Right? So we need to somehow identify wh whomever is starting that transaction, and that's where the problem lies. So there are two ways in the Solidity environment in which you, can, you could potentially do that. So one is called TX origin, and the other is called message.sender. Now, if you just have a contract that's being called directly from a user, they are exactly the same. They behave the same. Uh, but it is wrong to use TX origin. But you would never see that if you just have a single contract because then it behaves correctly. Now, the reason it's wrong is that in Solidity uh, or in, in the, on the Ethereum blockchain, contracts can actually call other contracts as well. Right? So you can have contracts that act like proxies. And then these things start to diverge. So here we have A, which might be a contract or a user, calling a contract B, calling a contract C. Now, as long as we're in B, TX origin and message sender are the same thing. They're A. But once we're in C, then TX origin still has the identity of A, 
your the entity that started that chain of transactions. And message.sender is B. So that's the last hop in the, in the chain of transactions. And the reason that matters is that if you have a, have a uh, situation like this, so if C is, is a victim's wallet, so it's some kind of wallet contract that does that authorization of is the right person calling, uh, and you have your victim here, so the owner, the attack that you can do is somehow make that owner uh, do a small transaction to you, right? So you need to do some phishing attack for that, but that's generally doable. And you would make sure that the victim calls your specific attack contract, so an attack contract you've deployed with the intent of draining the victim's wallet. That attack contract uh, can then choose to call the victim's wallet. Um, but if uh, at that point, TX origin will be the identity of the victim, right? Um, so if the, if the wallet contract does the authorization based on TX origin, uh, then actually the attacker here can easily impersonate that victim and then uh, uh, drain the wallet on his behalf. If the victim's wallet, if the wallet's contract would do authorization based on message sender, that would not work, right? Because the message sender would be the attacker in this case. Right? So it's really important to use message sender for authorization and not TX origin. Uh, so we're going to see how to detect that using SAST. Um, so this is what it typically would looks like in the code. So you have these require directives in Solidity to state conditions that must be true for the transaction to proceed. And we compare TX origin with owner. So owner being some, uh, something we record when the, when the contract gets deployed. And so here in the constructor, we set the owner and here we compare it. So this is vulnerable uh, to that attack that we just saw. Um, so the second vulnerability I want to discuss is the reentrancy attack. It's a little bit more subtle. Um, so what we have here is a contract that uh, allows someone to sell some of his funds and transfer them somewhere else. Right, so the sell function here has an amount. Um, now what's happening in that function is three things. So first we require whether it, the balance is enough. Right, so we, ch we check for that's just what you also would do with a bank transaction or anything. F before we proceed with a bank transaction, we check whether enough money is left on the account, which makes a lot of sense. Then as the second step, we uh, transfer that money to the receiver account. And then as the third step, if that's completed correctly, we're adjusting the owner's balance reflecting that he now no longer has that money that he has transferred. Right? So very basic, and that looks perfectly fine, especially in a normal relational database context when you would do all of that in a transaction, so it would be atomic. There's no problem at all with that code. In um, Solidity, this leads to hundreds of millions of damages historically, uh, and that's, there's a fundamental problem with this. And the reason is reentrancy. So what an intact contract can do is once it receives that payment as part of that interaction, then at that point, the attack contract can start a similar transaction on that same contract again. And at that point, the require condition would by definition still hold because the state hasn't been changed yet because that has yet to happen. Um, uh, and then more money would be transferred and that loop would continue like that until there is something that stops the loop. So instead of that transfer only taking place once, it would just take place indefinitely. Right? And that way the contract would be drained. So that's the re-entrancy attack. Um, if you think about you know, how, to, how to protect against this, and, you know, and, how to, and for a SaaS tool, how to distinguish like the, the safe versus the unsafe version of this, um, the main thing is, is the order of things. So the general advice is that you all, in, in Solidity, you need to do the checks, uh, then all updates to state, and then only do the interactions with the outside world as the very last thing in the flow, and that would prevent this. Another way to prevent this is that you would do locking. So you can also do locking to prevent reentrancy. So in the beginning of that function, you could say, well, if, if I'm locked, 
forget this. Uh, then if you're not locked, set the lock, then do everything else, and then unlock. If you do an algorithm like that, you would also be protected against this, uh, this particular vulnerability. So that's the thing that a SaaS tool should be able to distinguish. Um, now if you then think about what that means concretely for a SaaS tool, so those, both of these things, so the TX origin case and the reentrancy case, um, the TX origin case is interesting because it's, it's almost like taint, right? So the first intuition that you could have for that is that you would say, well, I'm going to treat TX origin as kind of like a source of taint, and I might have a new taint flag for that, like TX origin taint. And then that require function, that's like the sink, right? So if that TX origin value goes into the require function, we have a problem. That actually doesn't work with traditional taint algorithms. And the reason is that... Um, the taint here it originates from a comparison of that TX origin with something else. And the result of that comparison, by definition, is a Boolean value. And normally, a Boolean value is, is too stupid to contain taint. It's not enough information. And as an illustrative example, here on the top right, we have um, Java code that executes a SQL statement. And we get a string parameter in. We parse that as a Boolean. And then based on what that Boolean is, we make that uppercase true or false. And that goes into the SQL statement. That would actually be a very effective defense against SQL injection in that case. But right? if we didn't have that conversions going on, there would be SQL injection case. But in this case, because we first become a Boolean, that's not enough to contain any attack vector. But in the Solidity case, um, here we have that same TX origin problem then with the check factored out into a separate function called check owner. And then the Boolean is actually the thing that carries the problem. Right, so what we need to do to capture this with SAS is that we have uh, different propagation rules, so different ways in which taint behaves, uh, dependent on the type of taint we're talking about, where web taint or SQL injection taint does not behave in the same way as this TX origin taint. That's a distinction that we must be able to make. Um, if you look at a reentrancy case, um, there's a very different problem. The problem is, is that this is fundamentally not a data flow analysis thing. This is more about control flow analysis. This is about making sure that we are always in a secure state, where we know that certain events put us in an insecure state. And that's not really the same thing as tracking particular values or tracking uh, flags. You can emulate this a little bit by thinking about it as uh, data flow analysis on global variables, where some global variable uh, is used to track whether you have already done external interactions, but that has some associated problems with it. That's not really the nice way to model this. Um, so uh, concluding. Um, if you look at that first question that we started with, like is SAS relevant and interesting for these everything as code cases? Absolutely. There are many things where SAS can provide huge added value and there are many security problems to catch. Um, can we already do that now effectively? No. Right? So in some cases, own, and capability is very per tool. Everybody has something. But generally speaking, SAS technology is not there yet to really capture all of these cases effectively. But what do we need to do in the coming years to get there? What are we working on in our labs? Um, decorative modeling, right? Understanding those decorative paradigms better. Um, that language encapsulating thing, right? That we saw with JSON and ARM. Understanding that there might be different languages encapsulated. Uh, variations in taint flags. Better constant propagation. Better uh, distinguishing the propagation between uh, various taint flags, et cetera, et cetera. All the things uh, recovered. So if you think about what, what's the take-home message for this for you, it's not, some, not many things that you can take right now and start practicing or anything, right? So this is something a little bit more looking into the future. One thing that probably goes closest in that direction still is that if you would, if you would consider using SaaS technology now for any of these languages or frameworks, my advice would be to very carefully evaluate what, what they're covering right now because they might be covering less than what you would expect them to cover, or what you want them to cover. Uh, so you need to evaluate that so you don't get a false sense of uh, security. I think that's the most important thing to take home. So that's it. I think uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions if there are any.
solidity, the traditional SAS tools do not really work, right? But I'm now started seeing um, specific SAS scanners, for example, ETH scanner, right? So the specific scanners. Yeah. Um, what do they do differently uh, compared with SAS scanners? And uh, I know obviously all the declarative thing, but can basically, the question is, what do they do differently? How can this be backported, let's say, into a traditional SAS scanner? Is that a future possibility? What, what are the, what's the biggest challenge? Yeah, so I, I know they exist. I don't think they're d fundamentally doing anything differently. It's if you um, look at that overview of scanners in the beginning. Um, where do we go? Here. Um, so if you look at this list, so these are like well-known SAST engines. Uh, there are many more out there, uh, but they are being included by Gartner based on certain inclusion criteria, which is about languages that you cover and about the revenue that you have, et cetera, et cetera. There are smaller ones, um, the, uh, and, and some of those do cover solidity. Um, it's just practically, um, it's way easier to write a SAST analyzer for one particular language than to maintain one that has to cover dozens of languages like all of those do. Um, that's just quicker. And right now the situation is that some of these uh, uh, language specific analyzers have emerged for Solidity, but at this moment none of the major vendors have already included that in their product. Yeah, hi. Oh. Uh, just a question, in the modern up web applications, uh, the flow is like across technologies, like you have client side, React JS application and server side, yeah, you, you might have like Python or Java. So how do we like the modern, I mean, the tools I have used as CST, like they are mostly sh spitting false parties. Some are legitimate, but some are false positives. So how do we reduce uh, false positive in, in such scenarios? So you mean you're talking about the false positives that occur because you're not considering the front end logic and the back end logic in their entirety in the way, in the way they interact. Is that correct? Yeah, b because they are in different technologies. It, it just, the SAC tool just hopes that it is matching, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So there, there, that's, that's the source of some debate actually in the, in the industry. Um, like th there are some cases of um, like multiple technologies interacting that are are, are not disputed. Like if you would have a JSP page, for instance, that interacts with Java or an ASP.NET page that interacts with C-sharp code and that might inter interact with a local database using SQL, even though that crosses technology borders in a certain way, uh, that should all be considered as one flow. And if you don't do that, then you're just not, you're not doing perfect SaaS, right? And there might be technical limitations why it's not implemented, but generally you should definitely, as a SaaS tool, try to model that. If you look at the case of, um, a web front end talking to a web back end, right? So the, the front end running in a browser, uh, that's actually a different case. And a similar case is when you have like one web service calling another web service. There are, uh, there are two arguments that you can make. One is that you should consider that in its entirety, right? Because then you get more accurate results that are more representative of the normal flows. Uh, but you could also make another argument, which is like, why would a hacker, you know, uh, adhere to that normal flow? Right? You, if, if you have a couple of REST services that are being called by a React front end, then a hacker might just get rid of that React front end and then call that, um, uh, th those REST endpoints directly. And then if you would base your SAST analysis on the assumption that it would also, al also be call always be called via that React front end, you would actually get false negatives. Right? So that, that's more how we are looking at it from, from that angle right now. Yeah. Thank you all.